This other book that I recommended, that you can find it uh, free on the web if you are on the campus network. Uh, the way it's structured it has three parts. So this is the book. Well, um, I don't know how the um, cover looks like, but uh, the, actually the part three is optimization. And it has, I don't know, five or six actually chapters. Each is an individual problem uh, with a pretty much complete solution. And all these problems deal with linear programming. Uh, I think this one, uh, chapter optimization of manufacturer personal computers, I think it does a little bit of everything, like unconstrained optimization, constrained, and then um, uh, linear programming. So it um, should be a good kind of additional source for uh, examples. Um, in particular, as I said, this, I think it looks project B8. So that's optimization of manufacturer personal computers. It talks about, um, I told you it's, it's, a, it's in the exact same format as, as our book. It must have been just an addition, you know. Um, somebody thought of additional kind of uh, examples. But it, it talks about manufacturing two types of computers and all kinds of constraints and um, costs, uh, uh, cost, I mean, uh, price per unit and so forth. And then um, some of the goals of this model. Uh, so it, I'm not going to have time to talk about most of this. But you can see even the notation of the step one. It's identical. Build up of the profit function does unconstrained optimization um, with the help of a graph, then solves. If you can see that, um, and then it moves to what about if there are constraints? So it's I, I kind of um, encourage you to look through that. See some of the constraints are again. Um, the, the 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 way we uh, we've been looking at at, at them, um, and in this case again a linear linear programming problem you can uh, use a computer to uh, compute you know shadow prices sensitivities. Um, even the program that they use is the same as. I think this book we uh, used in the earlier edition, so Lindo, which uh, may or not may or may not be popular nowadays, or Maple. Um, so anyway, so it, and finally, you can see a linear programming setting up as a linear program, pro programming problem with Slack and. Um, Final interpretation, even uh, Newton's algorithm. Okay, and it gives a reference, so you can. I don't know if if any of these chapters clicks with uh, whatever interests you might have, then you can look for further reference. Um, I want to point to the first chapter. That's I think it's. Um, hold on. If you click on PDF, it will pop up. OK. So this project called A5 deals with wine production, better than pig problems, right? Um, you can read through this. Again, it talks about a producer um, making two types of wines, medium white, Dry white. Uh, it talks about the the profit for each type, and then t it talks about the um, uh, the constraints, right? So 
one type of, of uh, wine requires a certain amount of grapes, a certain amount of sugar, a certain amount of, of um, extract. Okay? And then the constraints that uh, the producer has a certain, you know, limited amount of each from each kind of raw material. Okay? And you want to maximize the profit. Okay? So that's shouldn't sound scary anymore. Okay? Um, so the point is that uh, we can recognize this as a linear programming. We can set it up as a linear programming, and the question is how do you solve the linear programming? Okay? Um, the approach they, they, uh, they use here is so-called uh, dual linear programming problem, which you haven't, we haven't talked about it. So the prime one and dual uh, linear programming problems um, kind of go hand in hand, and you can define one knowing the other. Usually you know the primal, you can define the dual. Um, but what I want to uh, point is uh, not not much about the dual formulation. So that unfortunately we don't have time to explain why we need a dual. Why sometimes uh, solving a different problem that you're uh, given. So you're given this problem. Okay. Two variables, three constraints, right? So your feasible set is in the plane, and you have three constraints, right? So it looks you can draw that line, that uh, that feasible set, right? So you could do it visually, or with the slopes, if you want, or you could just find what the vertices are and um, evaluate the objective function at, the, at, at each vertex, right? And then pick the one that where where it's maximum. Okay, but anyway, so that's not the point here. Um, the point is to illustrate how the simplex method works, and uh, I'm going to scroll down, so I'm going to skip this dual formulation, although maybe, let me just say, uh, if you're faced with a problem like this, <coughs> believe it or not, it's sometimes more advantageous to convert to a problem with three variables. So. The number of variables comes from the number of constraints in your original problem. And with two constraints. And why two? Because that's how many variables you have there. So you switch the roles of the constraints with the roles of the variables. Okay? So now you have you have three variables with two constraints. That's already harder to visualize, right? Because it's an R3. But for the computer, it's uh, sometimes it's it's much more efficient, much much faster to solve so-called this dual problem. For instance, for instance, using the simplex method. So let me skip this and go to um, the the original problem. The original problem has five x one plus four x two, and it's on the next page. So. We just remember that five and four, right? So then it's, um, and these are the constraints. And on what we say we do, we introduce what are called slack variables, right? Now all these constraints are less than or equal than. So what do we put? We just put plus x. I think we, I, I, I prefer u1, u2, u3, but x3, x3, x4, x5 with positive, uh, right, positive quantities, right, which in case they are zero, if, I, if at a vertex, right, x3 is zero, this means what? This means that first constraint is binding, right? So that is, that is the equality is actually satisfied at that vertex, okay? So, but some of these are, uh, could be positive, not all. The question is, how do you find wh which vertex uh, in that feasible set should be chosen as the max, as the as the optimal value? Uh, okay, so I just want to uh, point out how this simplex method works. Of course, this is a kind of a, a representation of what the computer algorithm does, right? And this is using the simplex, uh, what's called simplex tableau or just tables, right? 
So this is how our initial. So the simplex method is, as I said, is a search on vertices, right? So what happens is you're going to start with each, at each iteration, you're going to actually build this table or tableau uh, based on the uh, constraints and the, you know, variables. So you have, you're going to have five variables in this case, right? We remember we started with two variables and three constraints. These two are... Uh, if you want the decision variables, and these are the slack variables, right? Then on each row, you're going to put the coefficients of this of this constraint, right? Remember, these are now equality constraints. So you see three, four, one, zero, zero. Everybody sees that. So, so until the last row, which is not a constraint, but it's actually just the uh, objective function, right? And uh, I don't want to go into detail why we put negative, uh, negative the coefficients here. Not really, because no, this is now an equality constraint, so you just want to maximize this, right? Um, so it's like you want to minimize the negative ones. But the standard way of doing is is you, you write it as a maximization problem, and then you put the, the negative coefficients here. It would still be negative coefficients. Um, so the, the 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 way you actually um, proceed with this simplex method is you you uh, you do raw raw operations like you do in linear algebra on the rows of this, and the goal is to have this um, uh, uh, entries on the on the bottom to be all positive. Okay. So it's not really about you know uh, maximizing versus minimizing. Okay, so let me just point uh, the the step, the step, uh, the next step in this simplex method is to. Um, so, so let's see the the first the first time the first thing you do is 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 you is you. Uh, Identify what's called basic variables and non-basic variables, and again, that's that's sort of uh, typically what you have is you have. Um, let me scroll down here so you can see. So you see that's the that's kind of the end of of this of this optim of this uh, simplex method. The third tableau is. Uh, achieves positive entries on the last row, okay. And when you have positive entries on the last row, this means you have a you have um, a, a completed search, and you, you you can just read off this table. You can read off the coefficients, I mean the the vertex, right, the values. All right, and you see what do you see? You see that. What happens is you start, You always start with the slack variables as you know the identity metrics, right? But in the end, you end up with vertices that are. Uh, so you, you end up with the columns of the identity metrics that are not, you know, in in different places, right? So these are x1, x2, and x5. Uh, will be what's called the basic variables, and these are the non-basic variables. For this, for this, uh, uh, for this vertex. Okay. So anyway, so the idea is to go from one to the next is to uh, try to identify what I call pivots. So you see that number four on the first column is uh, pivot, meaning that 
you're gonna you're gonna try to make one instead of the you know in that place for that pivot and zero above and below by doing raw operations. Okay. And how is that pivot chosen? Well, the pivot is chosen by looking at uh, these ratios, and the ratios are just ratios of the right-hand side of the constraints to the entries in this in this matrix in the in this first column. Okay, so you see the ratios are 14 over 3, 2, and 3, and it, it's always the smallest ratio that's taken uh, that's chosen. Okay, some somehow that uh, the choice of the smallest ratio is is connected with the fact that you want to move to a vertex where the objective function is increases at most. Okay. Um, so you, you make that choice, and right. So so think about when you are in the first uh, in the first tableau corresponds to. Let me try to make this so, so we can, I can draw a picture. So the first tableau corresponds to hmm. OK. So interesting way of doing it but um, so your your picture is an X x1 x2 uh, plane and you have you're gonna have three constraints right so the first thing you do is you start with Let's say um, tableau number one corresponds to this vertex. Okay, and why does it correspond to that vertex? Because Let's look at the um, slack variables. So when I say, when I look at those slack variables, right, in the first tableau, I identify those three as the basic variables, and then the other two, the x1 and x2, are non-basic. So we always set the non-basic to zero, so that x1, x3 is 14, x4 is 8, and x5 is 6, right? This means I mean, x1 and x2 are both zero. This means you start at the origin. Okay. The next tableau is gonna. Uh, uh, what are the basic variables? x1, x3, and x5. Non-basic are x2, x4. So what will be the? Um, so the non-basic variables correspond to zero. I mean, are, are chosen to be zero. x2 and x4. x2 is zero. Right. And x4 is 0. So x2 is 0 means you're on the horizontal or vertical? I think vertical. Uh, excuse me, horizontal, right? So the next, the next tableau corresponds to uh, to the non basic variables to be x2 is 0 and x4 is 0. Now, the fact that x4 is 0 it means what? It means that constraint, what was that constraint? 4x1 plus 2x2 equals 8, right? This means 4x1 plus 2x2 equals 8. And of course, x2 is 0, it means x, I mean, you can identify what. Um, what the vertex is, 
if you want to, but the more the more important thing is it uh, you have you have found basically a vertex. I mean, you, you have identified what uh, what constraints is being binding for that vertex, okay? And is the second constraint. So that's kind of how you interpret this this uh, tableaus. Now the last one. Which one are the basic variables? X1, X2, and X5. Right? And the non basic are x3, x4. x3 and x4 are now 0. Right? And x, x2 is this, x1 is this, and x5 is this, right? So that's how you read the, the, the vertex of this tableau. Um, so you see x1 is 2 fifths, and x2 is 16 fifths. Right? So that's probably this one. So this one is a tableau number two, and tableau number three is x1 is two fifths and x2 is sixteen fifths. Okay. And uh, you also know which ones are the binding cons uh, binding uh, constraints. So x3 and x4 are zero means those two uh, constraints that led to those select variables. Are satisfied, so you know which which two, uh, right? Which two of the lines uh, give give rise to that um, vertex? Okay. So the fact that these these things are positive, kind of, um, well, there's a, there's basically a theory why uh, the the last row being po have positive terms. Uh, it gives gives uh, you know guarantees that you, you've reached the maximum. Okay. Uh, I think if 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 you never if you can never reach this stage, so if you can if you always uh, construct tableaus in which the denominator, I mean the last denominator, the last row has a negative uh, entry, then that means that you will never find a minimum or a maximum, right? Uh, let's see. So, so we went, we saw how we went from the first tableau to the second. How do you go from the second to the third? You identify the pivot again by choosing the ratio that's smallest. Okay, and of course, like what is two two and zero? That's infinite, so that's not the smallest. The smallest is sixteen fifths, so that's the pivot. Then you create this uh, uh, column of the identity on the on the second column, right? Yeah. If you always start the same way, the negative coefficients on the bottom row, how do you know what you found here? And if you're starting the same way, you can further minimize the maximum number of times. Do you other things to figure out, or this is good? Uh, Let's see. So, so I think this tableau is always by default. So, so in standard form, a linear programming for the simplex method has to be to maximizing maximize. Did you say it was in MATLAB. Okay, we're talking about two different things. If you if you're talking about the linprog, that's to minimize, right? Uh, if you're talking about the simplex method, just the algorithm, right? Not its implementation in any in any computer program. Um, for, for this kind of sequence to, to, to work, then you do it's to maximize, right? So I think your question is, what if you have to minimize this problem, right? If you have to minimize this problem, how did you how did you start it? How would you start it? Um, well, let's see. To minimize this problem, you would get. So I think you're right. You have to 
uh, because to minimize this problem, you'd, the origin would be the point where it's minimized, right? From the picture, right? So then, uh, then you're right. So you, then you would, then you would start with a five and four already positive, right? And then it would be done at the first tableau. So, so your optimization function, your your objective function has to be, uh, in this case, right, has to have at least one, to maximize, has to be at least one positive thing, right? One positive coefficient. So that when you put it in a tableau, it comes with a negative. So this is sort of in, in its simplest um, um, realization, sort of the simplex method. Um, the theory that, that goes behind it sort of would take some time to uh, to go over. Uh, I want to point out uh, there is an archive of courses, um, an optimization course that I taught in a summer uh, a year ago. and um, the first few lectures actually go go over, you know, uh, what exactly is, um, you know, why it's, why do you pick those ratios to be the minimum? Why do you uh, look at the uh, the last row to be positive? You know, why that why that guarantees you've reached the optimal and so forth. So you can actually um, watch those if you're interested in. And I can, you know, I have um, what was the course 442, 442, summer 2008. Um, let's see. Again, I have some. Um, you know, you can you can see some of this. Um, you know, same kind of uh, uh, discussion that we've, we're having here. So I don't want to spend too much time on this. Um, Talks about basic, non-basic var uh, variables, how you pick them. The point is, there is not an unique way of picking the var the the, var the basic uh, var variables. Let me see if it's. I think it's the, the second lecture that uh, there is a tableau. So. So may maybe I sh okay, maybe maybe the standard is minimum. Minimizing thing. If you, if we, if we do it in MATLAB, I mean, think about it uh, the same way. If, if you minimize this, but notice what happens here is, to to create a simplex tableau, you need to have equality constraints, right? So if you start from inequality constraints, then you have to introduce those slack variables. So that's that's kind of another example of simplex tableau here. Okay, coming from equality constraints. So I guess I should I should uh, uh, mention this that um, you may in in your in the problems that we talk about you may actually interpret some of the constraints as being equality constraints or inequality constraints. Um, it's never uh, very dangerous to interpret everything as inequality constraints. Uh, the only thing that's dangerous is to interpret inequality constraints as being of the wrong sign. So for instance, if you want to maximize, so sometimes some of these problems, if you don't treat them uh, correctly, then you, 
you would end up no, with no solution. So if I have so inequality versus equality constraints, and let me just take for instance uh, this, you know, this example. If I have to to maximize 5x1 plus 4x2 subject to and now I have, let's say I have um, 2x1 plus 3x2 less than or equal than actually I had it take this example here that um, okay let's look at this example here so I maximize this Uh, this objective function and I have these two constraints, right? These are inequality constraints. Okay, so this, this gives rise to a feasible set that's bounded. Okay? So I can maximize it. Right? So I have a maximum value, so I have a solution to this maximization problem. Now let's think of actually uh, changing this to an equality constraint. If I have an equality constraint for instead of the first inequality that's an equality constraint, then is it going to change the maximum or not? Well, the, the problem with inequality constraints has a maximum at this vertex, right? So this vertex both both constraints are binding, right? So this means that if you set one as an equality and the other one leave it as inequality, right? The maximum is still going to be achieved at the same point, right? So, so it doesn't hurt to have inequality or equality. Now, if you, if the maximum would not occur at this point, but maybe at this point in the inequality constraints and you change your equality your inequality this one which was negative x1 plus x2 x2 less than or equal than 1 to equality then the optimum will actually be forced to be living on that on this constraint line right so in other words <clears throat> when you when you change an inequality to equality constraints you're you're restricting sort of the feasible set right to a smaller region Right? So when you maximize uh, a problem over a larger region versus a smaller region, that's sometimes you may end up with the same number, the same uh, uh, vertex, vertex as, a, as an optimal vertex, but other times you may end up with um, different values, right? And of course, the examples where this makes more sense are when you have not two variables and three constraints, but you have uh, you know, s more than two variables and more than uh, more than uh, two constraints, so you can see the um, that it can change. So, so the example that has uh, again is is two variables, but let's say three constraints was this one the one we talked about earlier so it's uh it's 3 looks like an old tv set huh? so so the the constraints that we're we're talking about in that uh chapter were 3x1 plus 4x2 less than or equal than 14, 4x1 plus 2x2 less than or equal than 8, 
2x1 plus x2 less or equal than 6. Okay, and we set a maximum is achieved at 2 fifths and 16 fifths. And that was because I had three, let's say this, and this was the maximum, right? So again, if I change, if we change, oh, and I should say, this was constrained, I'm, go I'm just going to label this constrained, uh, I think this was constrained one, this was constrained two. So one, two, and three was here, okay? It's actually funny that this this actually are, are parallel to each other, aren't they? So they weren't actually a great example because because one trumps the other, right? This actually trumps this this constraint. So we need to change that a little bit. Can we change that? Um, yeah. Well, why is it not the smaller constraint that trumps the bigger one? Because they got to be less than or equal to both of those, so it would not be. Like well, if, if this is satisfied, this is automatically satisfied, right? Because you double this. You have to double this. Yeah, so would it be if the smaller one satisfied, the bigger one satisfied, not if the bigger one satisfied, the smaller one is? Yeah, so, so that's why I said so. So, so if this is satisfied, then 2x1 plus x2 is less than 4, so it's automatically less than 6. So, so in other words, this this constraint is kind of superfluous here, right? That's why you, we didn't get that, uh, you know, in the simplex method in the simplex tableau, we didn't get that. So the picture wasn't really um, accurate, but we didn't look at at the, at the coefficients. So um, I don't know if we can change that on the fly. We have to change this 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 third constraint to to match that picture. Which is probably not not very um, difficult. Thinking of the slopes like we did last time, right? So let's see. What is the slope? The slope of this one is negative two, right? The slope of that was negative three three quarters. So negative three quarters, negative two, and I want something that's actually less than negative three quarters. So I want something that is like negative a half, right? So I really want something that's like one here and two here. Okay. Right? So now the picture is, is looks uh, looks correct. Okay, but of course. And I believe this one is also going to be correct. Yes, no, maybe not. Yeah, it's correct, right? Remember, because we looked at the slope of the negative 5 fourths, so that fits where? Here or here? I think it fits between the these two slopes, right? So it means it's going to hit at this point. Okay, so that now, now it's 
now it should be the picture should match this, right? So now if I think if I if I change what would it, which inequality I need to change in an inequality to actually change this optimal value? Three, right? So if we if we change three, so if we change three into x1 plus 2, x2 has to be equal to 6, right? Then there's going to be a new optimal values or vertex. Which would need to be computed, but uh, we can almost, well, we can see on the picture what, what the maximum should be, right? Because now you're restricted on that, on that line where this vertex is not, right? This vertex did not belong to that line. Okay. But what's even worse, uh, so you have to be, so for instance, if we have the wrong, so I'll call this 3 prime, right? And if we, if we have the wrong sign and the inequality, so if I have x1 plus 2x2 greater than or equal than 6, so the feasible set, instead of being below this line, right, so being bounded, would be above the line, would be unbounded, right? So then the feasible set is unbounded, assuming, of course, leaving the other ones. Um, so it means that there is no optimal value, or we say the problem is infeasible. Yep. Because if I'm maximizing, uh, because it's unbounded, I'm maximizing uh, 5x1 plus 4x2. Right, I can take values of x1 and x2 as large as this allows me to take to take values as large as possible for both x1 and x2, and so maximum does, is not achieved. You you're going to that you know linear function that goes to infinity. So right, so this means the maximum of 5x1 plus 4x2 is infinite over that feasible set, right? If we call it S, then uh, the, the maximum over x1, x2 in that feasible set is infinite, so you don't have any optimum optimum value, right? So, what I'm saying here is that is that if sometimes you you set up your uh, the optimization problem with the constraints to be equality, it doesn't harm to change that equality. You know, any inequality as long as you know to, in which direction that inequality should go. So, so that we have a, a feasible set, yeah. Yes, certainly, certainly do. So, actually, the that example that we haven't worked it out, um, I didn't, I didn't, I didn't give you a code for. Let's see, has anybody looked at it? Because uh, I'd like to to just maybe program programming together. That's uh, example 3.5. And if you look, I'm just going to skip um, to page 84 where you see the um, the constraints. So I think we have lots of, uh, how many variables? We have 16 variables and we have uh, an objective function to be minimized, okay? That is a linear function of all 16 variables. I'm looking at page 84. In case you don't have the book, maybe you can couple with somebody that does have. Um, so some of the constraints are less than or equal than, some, some of the constraints are greater than or equal than. Okay. 
by just looking at this, could you tell if this problem is feasible or not? I don't think so, right? Because to be feasible, you have to have a minimum, right? You have to have a minimum value in that set, right? So in other words, you have to know that that simplex, well, if you could tell if the simplex is bounded, then you would be sure that it has a minimum and a maximum, right? Because it's a continuous function over a bounded uh, region. But it's, it's extremely hard to tell when you have so many variables and so many constraints whether this is, uh, that, that, that simplex is bounded, right? It's actually uh, hard to tell. So when you run the simplex algorithm, the fact that you reach to a you know a point where you know something happens in the tableau, right, guarantees that you do have a minimum. So it doesn't say that the the region was the feasible region is is bounded, but it just says that it's bounded in that direction where that objective function is could potentially decrease further, right? So you see the the, the feasible set doesn't have to be bounded. Or, uh, in all directions, right? It just has to be bounded where you know uh, where your kind of level curve of, of level curve or level set or level plane of your objective function is right can no longer slide to to more negative values to more less values. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Right, so you're above. So I guess your feasible region would be. Uh, well, so what I was saying is, if if this was a greater than or equal then, and you had to maximize you would actually be able to go in that feasible set which is infinite which is infinite unbounded and uh, and and make that quantity as big as as you'd like so you wouldn't have a a finite point right maybe that's not a most clear uh, picture i guess i guess one would have to really identify all the regions in the plane where you know that these three lines you know d uh, determine right think about maybe maybe to to see it a little bit better think about switching the second one so now instead of going has to be less than it's greater than right and the first one if you switch first and the second one then you can see the feasible set, right? The feasible set would be kind of going in that direction, right? Yeah. So with these problems, do we need to actually establish a bound? Like if there is? You cannot. You cannot establish. Uh, so in other words, when you have a large problem, you cannot say. I mean, if it's if it's if it's a two-dimensional or three-dimensional, maybe. When it's when it's multidimensional, you cannot uh, say a priori if, you, if it's going to be feasible or not. Okay. Uh, I guess you could say if 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 your objective is always has positive numbers and all your inequalities have positive coefficients and it's all less than or equal then, then I guess you could you could make that case. And also x1, x2, x all the variables are positive. You could make that case that is bounded, but the, again, the feasible set doesn't have to be bounded for your uh, linear programming to be feasible. That is to have an, a, a maximum, a minimum. So some inequalities could be the wrong way. Right. So you could have. You could have a feasible set that's like this, right? And then have a minimum, right? So 
So the feasible set is like this, and you always have a minimum, right? But it could be you could have a feasible set that is like this, right? That's infinite, and your objective function is just like it goes this way, increasing. So you have a maximum, right? Right? Because you slide this level curve parallel to itself, and, and this is where it hits last. Yeah, and some of these inequalities could be uh, the wrong way. I mean, it could be greater than or equal to n. OK, so let me. Uh, Uh, let me let, let's do this. So I have sixteen variables in this linear programming problem. I'm not going to list all of them, but uh, these are sixteen variables that correspond to, so x, i, j is the amount of dirt shipped from site i to site j, and refers to a table here at 3.3 .3 in the book that um, maybe I should have just scanned, but so the uh, site excavation, excavation site is one, two, three. There are four of them. And there is a um, receiving site, construction site, A, B, C, D. OK. and. This, this table just indicates um, distances, distances between sites. Okay? So the problem basically says um, try to find the optimal way of shipping dirt from excavation sites to receiving sites, knowing these distances, which translate into cost. Okay? And uh, let's see, there, there are some constraints, which unfortunately there are too many to write down, I guess. Um, but let me just start by listing. So for instance, for the first excavation site, you, can no long, you cannot uh, extract more than 150 uh, cubic yards. Or if you, if you read the problem carefully, it says the excavation site, one produces 150 cubic yards of dirt per day, right? So you could be saying, do I interpret this as an equality or as an equality constraint? And my point is it doesn't hurt to treat first the inequality constraint. That is to allow possibly less than 150 yards uh, to be extracted. Okay? Maybe the optimal is going to be achieved when this is actually going to be equality, right? But maybe not, right? If it's not, then you may wonder, I mean, you may ask the question, um, you know, if it's, if it's cheaper to actually have less than 150 from this first one, then maybe you should go with that, right? And live with uh, some you know some uh, leftover at, at side one, but now take a look at um, so anyway so I have these three sites so site one constraint site two constraint site three constraint so I have two more that I'm not going to list here right um, 
But now let's look at the side A constraint. So the, the, the side A requires 175 cubic yards per day. So this means x1a plus x2a plus x3a. Again, is it equal or is it at least 175? Or is it the most? So that one says at least. So it's, you can see the name. It has to be at least if it's not, if it, well, first of all, you could say it has to be equal, right? They say at least. Oh, did you say at least? No, it doesn't say at least. You say the building site requires 175 cubic yards of dirt per day. Oh, yeah, yeah. I'm reading his words after that when he starts solving it. Okay. So, again, it's a matter of, of well, it's not just interpretation. It's, it's what do you take out of this, uh, put it in the, in the problem, right? So, I'm saying um, you could start with the equality but you're restricting that uh, feasible set, right? And so by letting it a larger set, you may be able to find a lower minimum than if you had equality constraint. Now, if you were to choose less than or equal then, then you run the risk of doing what? Of having a, an infeasible problem, right? I mean, certainly, if it, if you if you if you kind of restrict it to be strictly less or like, like less than or equal than 174 or something, that doesn't re, uh, satisfy your your requirement, the problem, right? So it has to be at least, okay? And then all the others, okay? So now let's try to let's try to um, uh, put this in MATLAB. So in MATLAB. Linprog requires all inequalities to be less than or equal than, right? So in, in, the, in which case, you have to rephrase side A as being minus x1a minus x2a minus x3a less than or equal than negative 175. Okay? So you have to, you don't change the constraint, it's just you put negative numbers in front of it, okay? And then the same with all the greater than or equal than inequalities. Okay, so then um, let's see. Can we build that matrix? Well, we can certainly start building it by hand. So uh, the important thing is to realize is what's the order of the variables. So the order of the variables should be you have to list them, right? So the column of the variable should be x1. So let's make, on a, let's make that. Uh, so I have a times x less than or equal than b, right? So what is x going to be? Well, let's start x1a, x1b, x1c, x1d, x2a. OK, can we do that? A and we have to we have to make a convention. So we start listing the by 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 excavation site. Okay. And by the way, what will be the matrix A? How many rows and how many columns? Well, the number of co the number of columns is the number of variables, right? So, sixteen variables. It means so number of of variables, right? Right. So, when you write this, you just imagine seeing the constraint. You can see it on the page. Um, you can see those coefficients. Not not all of them, because a lot of them are zero. But um, so that's how many constraints there are? Seven constraints. Seven number of constraints. So you have to kind of populate a matrix seven by sixteen. That's 
lots of numbers, right? That's like a hundred some uh, entries in that matrix. But a lot, lots of them are zero, right? So, um, so one thing to do is to, instead of typing uh, here, I would type it in a in a in a file, right? So, and I just start doing this, right? I have to do 16 of this, right? Quite inefficient, right? But that's what it is. You just have to input that matrix. So instead of doing this, what do you think we should do? First, start with zeros, 7 by 16, right? And now we start assigning the non-zero entries. So to do that, we're going to do, um, we can do the following. So we have to start the first four on the first row, right? So it's going to be um, 1 through 4. I'm sorry, on the first row. So that's, that's actually on the first row, 1 through 4. And I assign this to be. One, let's see, does this work? So I can try this at the command line. Okay, I don't want to display any of this, but. So let's open the. Remember, in the workspace, we see what we've created. So we can see this matrix. OK. So see it created the, those four once. By the way, we could, we could just go like in Excel. We could just now start modifying the values there. So if we change this value into 1, It doesn't work. I mean, the code. You need to do this in a code. Um, but I'm saying, I'm saying, if you just need that metrics, right? You can do it any way you want. I mean, multiple ways. Um, the new A is now, um, you know, has the right thing. But you're right. I mean, if I were to do it in a code, I'd have to do it on the second. So the second constraint is the which ones? Five through eight. Yep. The third, the third constraint is the nine through the twelve, and the last one is thirteen through the sixteenth. Okay. So if I run this code, I need to call it somehow, right? Dirt. Now you see it created, um, right? It, it replica replicated the, four, the first four constraints, OK? And now we need to do the other one. So A of 5 and, uh, and what? Now it's a little bit tricky, right? So now it's the receiving sites, right? So it's X1A. X1B, X1C, and X1D, right? No, I'm sorry. No, I'm sorry. We, we had it wrong here. So, sorry. So we had only the first three. OK, so the fourth one is not right. Only the first three rows were corresponding to the constraints of the excavation sites. And now I have four, the last four rows correspond to um, to greater than or equal to any constraint. So now we're going to have to put negative ones in the right places. So how do we do that? So the fourth one, so I need to, let's say I need to, I need to run this again just to be. Uh, what happened here? Oh, yeah. 
Okay, so I need to run this. So now the third, the, the fourth, the fifth, the sixth, and the seventh rows are, are all zeros. So now I have to do A4 and um, A1A, A2A, A3A, A4A. So these are sitting on this on this slot, sorry, so uh, 4, 1, 4, 5, right? I mean, you could do it fancy, but Does everybody uh, kind of understands what I'm doing here? Just populating this this huge matrix with ones and negative ones. Okay, so now I have this, and I have to copy this for each of the constraints, but with a fifth instead of four. Again, you can make this in a line with a for loop if you want. And now not one, but but two, not. Five but six, so just an increment by one. Fourteen, and at this point you can start thinking maybe I should do this smarter. But we're kind of uh, running low on time, so let me just. Uh, what was it? Thirteen. Now it's fourteen. Should be fifteen. Yeah, mm -hmm. and the last one is seven, right? So six. Okay, so this. Hmm. Huh? Six fifteen, and now seven three, seven four. 8, 12, 16. Okay, so now when I run this, the metric should be uh, as I want it. Okay, and the last thing to do is to define uh, B. So now what is B? B is the right hand side, so I have 150. Remember, this is a column 400, 325, and the others are negative 175, negative 125. Negative 225, negative 450. Okay. So your fourth row is dead. Your fourth row is going to hold zero there. So I, I didn't define it. Oh, I didn't define this. So what happened? I think I just deleted this, so. Okay, so. What's the. Um, okay, so now I should be right. So, last thing to do is to define the objective function, which is going to be f and that will be 10 4 12 20 8 so this is this come out of the table right Okay, so let's hope this is right. Okay, so now all we have to do is so let me let me just run this. So now I have these things. Uh, it's a 16 by 1, so that's right. So now let's just lin prog. And remember, we need to maximize. So we're going to put minus f. No, we need to minimize. So that's f. A B. Let's just leave it like this. Okay, so this seemed to have terminated. Ooh, no. Uh, let's see.
Yeah. Maybe I should post the correct code. Yeah. Um, right. So, so what? What when you see something like this? What is what is probably the most? Uh, what is the culprit? You're right. You have to have the the lower bound, right? Yeah, so that, that's the problem here. We don't have the lower bound. Unfortunately, it's kind of low on time. So let, let's call lower bound zeros 16, 1. And now I have no equality constraints, no equality constraints, lower bound, no upper bound. Thank you. <laughs> so when you, do, when you don't specify the lower bounds, the computer just can go to negative value, negative infinity, right? But now, um, so it looks like the signs were right, right? But if some of the inequalities were wrong, then he could allow to go infinite, you know, uh, in time. Um, so the only thing that I want to say about this homework due Wednesday is the last two problems that have linear programming. Um, you have to make sure that you have the right, the, ver the variables right. So I think it, it's very similar to this one, actually. It has sites, you know, um, well, it has... I think one of them has 12 variables, and the other one has, I don't know, fewer variables. But um, try to interpret them as inequality constraints. And then go in the same, once you have this code, you can actually reassign some of the inequalities to equality constraints. right? And then see what happens depending on the, you know, whether those constraints are binding or not. right? Everybody knows how to see the constraints are binding or not? Looking at the stack ver uh, slack variables, so you need to know how to display them and so forth. So you need a slack and zero. The slack is zero is binding. So which means it doesn't matter if you put equality or inequality. Yeah.